Welcome back to The World Over. She runs the world's largest library. Its collections include millions of books and recordings, photographs, maps, even films. She's the first woman, the first African-American, and the first professional librarian in over 60 years to lead our national library. To learn about the Library of Congress's vast collection and the vital importance of literacy, we asked the Librarian of Congress for her thoughts. I recently spoke with Dr. Carla Hayden. Take a look. Now, I want to talk a little bit about you and then about this amazing collection. You have a unique vision of libraries that has so struck me as I've read about your career. You were in Chicago, you ran the libraries in Baltimore. You see them as much more than repositories of books. In fact, they're the cornerstones of democracy. They mm. really are one of the few places that everybody can feel part of and they're welcome and we like to think of ourselves as really a refuge but also a place that you can soar. Hmm. And you expanded what Baltimore was doing. I mean, it wasn't just giving out library cards or finding books for people. You were you turned it into really an educational center for the community. In fact, we even called it an opportunity center. Right. And it was the place that people could go and get online to apply for jobs. About 85% mm. to 95% of all jobs, any type of job, you have to file online, you know, mm. apply online. And most people in some challenged areas don't have that access. And so we had health fairs, gave out flu shots, all of these types of things. Amazing. Tell me about, there's one little boy that I saw referenced in some of your interviews, a boy named Leonard in Chicago. Tell me about him and how he kind of characterizes exactly what you're talking about. And Leonard was part of the reason that I said, this is the profession for me. Mm. I was assigned to a storefront library on the south side of Chicago, and it was a pretty challenged neighborhood, and there was a little boy, Leonard, who was bullied and teased because he had a, a facial uh, deformity. Mm -hmm. And he would come into the library, and we struck up a friendship, and after a while, he would sit right next to my desk, and pretty soon he was... Uh, sorting cards, he was helping with preparing the crafts, and years passed and Leonard finally, he had surgery hmm. that allowed him to be hmm. more accepted, but he would, and he became a teenager, and then he would pass the storefront and wave at me. Huh. And it made me feel so good because he found that place in the library. That safe spot that to, safe to spot. grow and be affirmed. And, and then... he would read books and mm. he, could, he was so interested in so many things. Oh, amazing. I, I want to talk for a moment about this astounding collection that even I didn't realize until I moved to Washington what the Library of Congress contains. You incidentally have 3,200 staffers who, who you, you oversee, and 160 million community. items, including things like uh, the, the, the George Gershwin's piano, our friend Jerry Lewis's film collection. Home movies. Home movies. Why do we need all that? Uh, well, it's the collective cultural memory and historical memory of the United States and the world. Mm. And it, it really is a resource for anyone that has curiosity, that wants to find out more. And we also are sustaining creativity and saying this is a celebration. You recently digitized something near and dear to my heart. 20 years ago, I know I'm confessing, I, I was going to write a play about Alexander Hamilton a oh, little darn. late now, but I took <laughs> notes 20 years ago. They put me in one of your special yes. collections room with the gloves and I flipped through Hamilton's letters and read many of them for days. You now have digitized all of these yes. letters. T tell us about that. And that's effort. the wonder of it. When you think about, for instance, the papers of 23 presidents from George mm. Washington to Coolidge, the diary of Teddy Roosevelt, where he marked on mm. February 14th, the day that his mother and his wife died, and he said, my life is over. Mm. And then you have Hamilton's letter, his last mm. letter to his wife before yeah. the interview, as they called it, mm, yeah. and that people can of course, visit and look at these things just like you did, but with digitization, anyone, that little boy, 
yeah. south side of Chicago, can sit at a computer and look at Hamilton's letters mm. and the letters of his wife. It's amazing. Are you worried that the dis digitization will um, force people or, or encourage them not to make the experience of going to a library and reading a hard book or a hard manuscript? Well, and I'm smiling because digitizing whets the appetite, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> okay, so once you see it, and then you want to see the real thing. Uh -huh. And that's another part of it. And you want to read more about it. And it just gets you going. So that's what we're trying to do. Tell me about the, the origins. I was fascinated by this. The origins of the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets when he was assassinated. Give me this backstory of how this came to In me. 1975, the Librarian of Congress was new and was exploring the office of the librarian. And there was a door that seemed like it didn't go anywhere. And so he opened it, and behind the door was a safe, like a bank safe. Huh. However, there was no one that could open it. And... Uh, the legend goes that a, a gentleman was uh, released from a facility who had special skills <laughs> and opened the safe and there was only one thing in the safe and that was a small box and he opened it and it said these are the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets the night he was assassinated and oh. it was given to the library by Abraham Lincoln's granddaughter. Oh my gosh. And he had two pairs of spectacles. He had articles about himself that some were good, some weren't. Mm. He had um, a handkerchief that had his initials. He had a $5 a Confederate bill. Mm. And then something that really touches you in a way because he had a button that had come off of his pocket. Yeah. And just think about the humanness of that. If uh -huh. something, if this comes up, you hey, put it. You pick it that, up. Mm, beautiful. It yeah. tells us a lot. It humanizes him. It, it brings humanizes him, him. He was a real person in so many ways, and he's relatable. Do you feel yourself as a library of Cong a librarian of Congress, do you feel that you are the custodian of Americans' literacy or America's literacy? Is that an, a burden you feel? Oh, no. We're partners with mm. so many other types of organizations and institutions, and so working together, we can really work on, I think, something that people might not realize, that illiteracy is uh, unfortunately a contributor to a lot of the challenges that people have worldwide. Right. When you think about 65% of peop adults worldwide are functionally illiterate, mm. and how that contributes to some of the issues that they face in life. Oh, no, this has become a passion of mine, writing for children. You see the vast weight and the, the, the bitter patrimony you pass along to them yes. if they can't read or if a parent can't read. So I love that you've committed so much of your work and the Library of Congress to fostering reading. Before I let you go, Madam Librarian, Storyented, which is what this segment is, it's, it's a literacy initiative I founded, but the idea is stories orient us in the world. They show us our place in the world. What was the story that set you on your path and the lesson you gleaned from it? What, when you talked just now about your place in the world, mm -hmm. the book, and I love to read, and I was going to this storefront library on my own across yeah. from the school. I was about eight, and some person put a book in my hand, Bright April, mm. and it was about a little girl who was brown like me. She was in the brownie troop. She had two pigtails, and for the first time, I saw myself reflected in a book, mm. and that taught me that children need to have books as windows on the world, yeah. but also they need to see themselves in something that we say is so important, books and literacy. Right. And then it's like, there I am, and there's my family. Hmm. And since I've been talking about it so much lately in terms of influences in my life, I've received letters from women from varied backgrounds. The first one came from a woman in Minnesota who said I was a skinny, a uh, girl handicapped and Bright April was my favorite book mm. because she was an outsider. And then recently a woman in Connecticut who shared it with her two daughters and found a copy 
a battered copy, she said, and she just read it to her granddaughters who identified with this little girl. And so that just, that lesson that young people need to get something from a story too, not just entertainment, but Yeah, and the importance overall. of diversity in books, yes. particularly children's books, because it is important for kids to see themselves and place themselves in that drama. Right, and that's what the, the pull is. You can imagine yourself taking great adventures mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. types of books, but it's also good to see something that relates to you too, because that's what yeah. reading can do. Uh, tell, give me your strategies. You've spent your life as a librarian and you interact daily with young readers. What would you advise parents who have reluctant readers at home? What are they missing? What should they be doing? What they might want to do is think about making reading fun mm -hmm. and not being too prescriptive. If they want to read a comic book, fine. Let them read it. Because they're reading and it's the practice of reading and mm -hmm. readers uh, become better when they practice and they can read a cereal box, they can read that and also to model reading in the home. I had that advantage uh, with a grandmother that read to me and would read next to me, my mom. And so show them, and, and you don't have to read War and Peace. Mm -hmm. You can be reading a magazine and it's reading time and everybody gets to read what they want. And mm -hmm. if they see an adult doing something, you know, they will model. They, they follow it, yeah, no, right. that's great advice. Great advice, final question. You were appointed by President Obama for this position. I am a little distressed that he dropped the lifetime appointment and turned this into a 10-year appointment. Your thoughts on that? Was that a good idea or maybe not such a good idea since you're just well, getting started? Well, actually, Congress decided, and it was, I think, a good decision because libraries are evolving and changing, mm -hmm. and you might need to make sure that you were changing as well in terms of the leadership. So I think it's okay, and okay. especially at my age. Oh, come on, <laughs> your age. And your mother is still with us and lives in your building, you would tell yes. me. Yes. I mean, it must be amazing having your mother there, watching you and breaking down the barriers you've broken down and being the example you are. I mean, you're, you're, you're like bright April to well, a lot of girls looking in. I have to tell you, though, my mom was the example because she was um, in social work in Chicago. And some of my earliest memories were sitting, doing my homework in the back of a community meeting mm -hmm. that she was heading up in housing departments, the social services mm -hmm. that she was responsible for, battered women's uh, mm -hmm. shelters, working with youth and gangs and all of that. So I grew up with this service, service and using the thing that I'm involved in to serve has been a watchword. Wow, and to have your mother there along for the Oh journey. my goodness, she's what a, a stay-at-home mom, she says now though. <laughs> I love that. She had to work when I was coming up. Carla Hayden, thank you so much for this. <laughs> thank and you. For, and for the great work you're doing. You can keep up with all the doings at the Library of Congress and view many pieces of their collections by visiting their website. They're at LOC.gov.